I carry these with me every day. Welcome to Battle Ready. I'm Doug Barry. I appreciate you being with us. You know, this show exists for one main reason. I've said this before. This show exists for one main reason. That is to wake up the fighting spirit in every one of us. Young, old, male, female, child, adult. To wake us up to the reality, to be aware, prepared for, and engaged in a spiritual fight. This is something that is critical. It is essential. In a world, if you look around, we see a world that does not take this that seriously. And yet we've been told in Scripture, told by our Lord Himself, the Holy Spirit's inspiration of those writings in Scripture that remind us of the reality of this battle. One of the most prominent, we've brought this up many times before, Ephesians 6. We cannot forget it. Ephesians 6, draw your strength from the Lord. Put on the armor of God. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities of darkness, wicked rulers of heavenly realms. We're told in 1 Peter 5.8, be watchful and alert, sober, vigilant. Why? Because the enemy's roaming around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Revelation 12, the entire chapter speaks of the reality of this spiritual battle. The war that breaks out in heaven. The devil and his angels that rejected God, rejected God, were cast out of heaven because it was no longer a place for them. They were defeated and they were cast down to the earth. Verse 12 says, Woe to you, earth and sea. The devil has been cast down to you in a fury. Furious. We're in the midst of this spiritual battle. And we see things around us today. We see things around us. Oh, many do not. Many will not acknowledge it. But we see things around us that we know are so far out of order. And in some ways, as bad as they've ever been, worse than they've ever been. In 1976, Pope St. John Paul II in Philadelphia reminded us of the times that we're in. He said then, in 76, 1976, that we had entered the final conflict between good and evil, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the Antichrist. He goes on to say that this conflict is so severe and that many people don't understand it, but that God has given us this time and called us to take up this challenge with courage. So we have all of this. We've talked about this in previous shows. But we have to be reminded oftentimes of the reality and the seriousness of this battle. You know, Pope St. John Paul II also told us over and over, reminded us the words of Scripture, be not afraid. Be not afraid. We're not supposed to be afraid of this battle. We're supposed to be ready, though, to deal with it. And be ready means that we use what God gave us, the means that God gave us to deal with it. You know, years ago, I had the great privilege of having a private conversation with Mother Angelica. This was maybe 18, 20 years ago. And she said to me at that time, at that time, she had said, Doug, things are so far gone in our world. The only thing that's going to turn things around is divine intervention. We're living in a very serious time right now. Friends, it's important that you and I take seriously what's going on around us and that we respond. Remember the words of Pope Leo XIII and his encyclical Christians as citizens. Moreover, he says, moreover, the Christian is born for combat. Now, the combat, again, Ephesians 6, spiritual warfare, first and foremost. That's our primary place we begin all of this thought process of combat is right there in the spiritual realm. But we have to remember that as the Christian is born for combat, God is not going to leave us on the battlefield unprepared. At least he's not going to leave us there without the weapons and the armory that we need to deal with the battle. When it comes to battle, any soldier knows that if you're going to go into a battle, you need some sort of weapon to deal with the battle. You also need some sort of protection, some sort of shield. Think back to the time of knights, castles, kings. Consider what the warriors of that time had to do when they engaged in battle. Think of the weapons and the defensive things that they had to protect themselves in the battle. Primary weapon the knight would have is a sword. You go into conflict with someone, into combat with another individual with a sword, though, and you're swinging a sword at someone, you have to realize they're probably swinging a sword at you. There may be arrows flying at you, the flaming darts of the enemy. So what the knights would have with them oftentimes, of course, is a shield. They would go into the battlefield with a sword and a shield. For the modern-day soldier, it's no different. Soldier runs into combat. He has his rifle, his offensive weapon. He's wearing body armor, a helmet as his shield to protect him. 
God knows that we need the same thing in the spiritual battles that we fight, on the spiritual battlefield that we are on. We need the offensive weapon and the shield. And he gives it to us. He gives us the rosary, for example, as our spiritual sword. And he gives us the brown scapular as our shield, our sword and our shield. And in both of these cases, when God gave these to the world through the Blessed Mother herself, to St. Dominic with the rosary and St. Simon Stock with the brown scapular, in both cases, they were given to us to deal with combat, with conflict, especially the powers of hell. Now, these are great sacramentals, and the church gives us many sacramentals to help us in our faith, to help us in this fight. The church defines sacramentals as a sign that bears resemblance to a sacrament. A sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. A sacramental, such as blessed salt, holy water, the scapular, or the rosary, etc., these and all sacramentals, what they do is they help prepare us to actually be able to receive the power and the grace that's coming through a sacrament. Many of these sacramentals, such as these two, get forgotten. Many people look at the rosary, oh, that's something my grandma does. That's something I, I pray a rosary at funerals. And the rosary oftentimes gets tucked away in a drawer somewhere. It gets forgotten by many, many people, unfortunately, sadly. It's a powerful weapon, powerful. The, the gates of hell fear the rosary like no other spiritual weapon, no other sacramental. The scapular, we get invested in the scapular oftentimes at First Communion for a lot of us. What happens to the scapular later? Well, because it's an awkward feel and it, it kind of hangs strange over the body and it interferes with people's fashion, their clothing. Oftentimes the scapular is discarded and it ends up maybe hanging on a bedpost somewhere. This is what's so sad about these great and powerful traditional sacramentals, these weapons that God has given us, is we have abandoned many of them. So we wonder why when we look around the world we see so many things falling apart. We see families in disarray. We see marriages collapsing. We see lives turned upside down. We see the addictions. We see the confusion that people have of their own gender, their own sexual identity. We see all of these problems and we wonder why they're continuing to grow and intensify in our world today. We're not using the weapons that God has given us to fight this fight. If your shield is hanging on a bedpost or tucked away in a drawer somewhere, get it out, put it on and understand what it's for. If your rosary, your sword is, is sitting in a box somewhere at the bottom of a, of a drawer or a shelf, back in a shelf somewhere, get it out and start wielding that sword again in prayer and realize that the powers of hell fear the weapons that God has given us to fight this fight. But God does not force our hand. He does not force our free will. And that's what this boils down to. One of the things about battle ready is that we need to be aware, prepared for, and engage. And all that means act of the will. It means a determined decision, an effort that we must make that we must make the effort with the weapons that God has given us if we're going to be successful, victorious in these battles that we are all in. One of the most important things about these, though, is we need to understand them. We need to understand where they come from. If we don't understand where they come from or why they were given to us, at the time they were given to us, it's hard for us to more seriously appreciate how powerful they really are. In 1251, the Blessed Mother appeared under the title of Our Lady of Mount Carmel to a man named Saint Simon Stock. Now, Saint Simon Stock at the time was in his 80s. He was the superior of the Carmelite order. This took place in Aylesworth, England. During this apparition, our Blessed Mother gave to Simon Stock one of the greatest treasures, one of the greatest sacramentals that Almighty God has ever given the world, the brown scapula. But to understand the power of the brown scapula and the significance of Mary appearing under the title of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, it's important to go back and look at some history behind the Carmelite order. The Carmelites find their origin in Mount Carmel, which is not so much a mountain, it's more a mountain range off the coast of Palestine. This is the location where an event took place in the Old Testament, one of the greatest battles between good and evil ever in the history of man. The great prophet Elijah had confronted King Ahab, a wicked king of Israel at the time, Ahab was involved in worship of the false and diabolical god Baal. There was an effort going on at the time to destroy all the prophets of God. Elijah was the only remaining faithful prophet who was unafraid to approach Ahab. During this time, he told King Ahab to have all the people of Israel and the 450 false prophets of Baal 
meet him on the top of Mount Carmel. Once the people of Israel had joined with the false prophets of Baal to meet with Elijah on the slopes of Mount Carmel, Elijah gave them a challenge. We shall determine, he said, who is the true God. Let us pick two bowls. We'll offer them up on two altars. You call upon your God, Baal. I shall call on the one true God. And we'll see which one sends fire to consume the sacrifice. So the prophets of Baal built an altar, picked a bowl, slaughtered it, and laid their sacrifice upon the altar. And then from morning to noon, they called out for their diabolical god, their false god Baal, to send down fire to consume their sacrifice. But there was no response. So the prophets of Baal hopped around the altar. They began to slash at their flesh with swords and spears, which was part of a ritual of theirs, until blood gushed out, covering their bodies. But still, there was no response. Elijah taunted them. Call out louder, he said. Maybe your God is busy. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's asleep and he needs you to wake him up. But still, there was no answer. Then it was Elijah's turn. He chose 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He built an altar out of these 12 stones. His bowl was slaughtered and the body laid on top of this altar. He arranged the wood and then a trench was dug out around the altar. He then turned to the people and told them, fill these jars with water and pour them all over the sacrifice, all over the wood, all over the stones, and then do it a second time and then a third time. After three times, so much water had been poured over the sacrifice, over the altar, over the wood, over the stones, that the trench around the altar was filled with water. And then Elijah prayed. He called upon God, please, that these people would know who you are and that you are the one true God. And God responded. And then God sent down fire from heaven, devouring not just the offering on the altar, not just the bowl, not just the wood, but the stones and the dust and the water in the trenches all lapped up by this fire. At that time, the people of Israel fell prostrate on the ground, crying out praise to the one true God. Elijah demanded that all the false prophets of Baal be held captive, that none of them should be allowed to escape. And then he had them taken down to the Kishon Brook, where he killed them all. That is the account we read of Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18. Fast forward to the end of the 12th century, a handful of former crusaders, men who understood battle, understood the sword, they came to the slopes of Mount Carmel to choose a life of austerity and dedication like the great prophet Elijah. They lived in the countryside and among the caves of Mount Carmel. This is the foundation. This is the origin of the Carmelite order. Nearly half a century later, in Aylesford, England, in 1251, Our Lady of Mount Carmel appears to St. Simon Stock, bringing him this weapon, this shield. In the battle that we face, understanding the significance of the title of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, realizing that she brings us a spiritual weapon, her name rooted in a place where one of the great battles of the Old Testament took place between good and evil. She tells St. Simon Stock that those who die, dedicated to what this scapular means and wearing this faithfully shall not suffer eternal fire. Years later, in the early part of the 14th century, the Blessed Mother appeared to Pope John XXII and spoke to him of what we know as the Sabbatine privilege. What that means, according to the words of Our Lady to John XXII, is that anyone who faithfully lives out and fulfills the conditions of the brown scapular, she will not leave after their death, even in purgatory, that she will come to them on the first Saturday after their death, and she will free them and lead them to the holy mountain of everlasting life. The conditions of the brown scapular are simple. First, one must be invested in the scapular, which can be done by any priest, and then wear the scapular faithfully. Second, we must live out the virtue of chastity faithfully according to our state in life. And third, we must pray the daily rosary. Wearing the brown scapular is a reminder of our consecration to Mary. It's a reminder of dedicating our lives to Jesus through Mary, which is something we all should be doing. It is essential for the salvation of our souls. And the more we think of Mary, our Blessed Mother, the more we will think of her Son, because that is what she does. She leads us, moves us, directs us to Jesus.
EDC, everyday carry. The things that you and I choose to keep with us, to keep on us, to keep near us every day to help us get through the day and accomplish the task at hand. Women will take items like this and others and throw them in a purse. And that purse becomes the bag for their everyday carry. They'll keep it near them throughout the day. Men, we throw them in our pockets. We'll take items like this and more and throw them in our pockets or in a briefcase or maybe in a backpack. Everyday carry items, things that we find are necessary. We choose items that we think are necessary and important, valuable to us in order to make sure we can complete the things that we have to do throughout a day. For example, if I'm gonna drive somewhere, I need car keys, I have to operate the vehicle. I also have on this keychain here, I have house keys. Maybe you've got keys to get into your place of employment, your place of business. Maybe a key to open a PO box and check your mail. Car keys, keys in general, understand necessary. In the wallet, I've got my driver's license, credit cards, debit card, cash. Again, necessary stuff to accomplish my day-to-day -day task any given day of my life. Phone. This is one of those items that many people will say is the most important everyday carry item they have. There are people who will not let this phone get more than a foot away from them, if even that. 24-7, this little guy does not leave their side. A knife. Keeping a pocket knife on hand, not a bad idea. It's a good tool to have around. This one in particular has a glass breaker and a seatbelt cutter for emergency circumstances. Again, good knife. It's a good tool to have with you. Flashlight. I like to have a flashlight on me. It's good when you're walking through a dark parking lot, maybe coming around a corner into a dark room. Helps light up that room. But of all the items that I have here, this one, the rosary, is by far the most important everyday carry item I should have on me. The car keys help me operate a vehicle, drive from A to B, home to a store, to work, back home. The rosary helps me travel to heaven. The phone helps me communicate horizontally with the people of this world. The rosary helps me communicate vertically with the next, the place I really want to be in the end. The flashlight helps light up a room. The rosary helps light up my day, especially the dark times of my life. You get the point. You see where I'm going with this. The items that we choose to have with us, to have on us, to have near us on a day-to-day -day basis are essential to help us get through that day. What is more important than something like the rosary? Our prayer life. The rosary is not superstitious. The rosary is not a good luck charm. The rosary is a, a tool. The rosary is a weapon. We should never leave our spiritual lives at home. We should never leave our spiritual lives in the church on Sunday. We should never leave our spiritual lives anywhere. We should always have that with us. We should be developing and growing in that spiritual life. We should never leave our prayer life to just prayer before meals or prayer before bed. Our prayer life, our spiritual life must go with us every day. We must carry it with us every day into the world. That's what we're called as Christians to do. That's what evangelization is. But we're not going to be able to do it if we're not prepared, if we're not carrying it with us every day. The devil despises and fears the power of the rosary. I'll never forget an exorcist who said, you should never leave your house without a blessed rosary with you at all times. The rosary that we know today has many different origins, you could say. But what we have today came to us in a miraculous moment when the Blessed Mother herself appeared to St. Dominic in the 13th century. St. Dominic, the founder of the Dominicans, was fighting against a tremendous heresy that was causing great damage in the south of France at the time, Albigensianism. Now this heresy was spreading rapidly and causing great harm to many faithful people. Dominic preached intensely against it, but seemed to be making little progress. At one point, he went off into the woods to spend several days in deep prayer and fasting. And during that time, the Mother of God appeared to him. The Mother of God appeared to Dominic and said to him, Dominic, do you want to know what weapon the Blessed Trinity wants you to use in this war? It is my angelic psalter. She referred to it as a battering ram. The form of the rosary that you and I know today, what we are familiar with, came to us from the Blessed Mother herself through Saint Dominic. Dominic began to preach about the rosary. He preached by speaking about different parts of the scriptures. That's what the rosary is. It's the Word of God. The mysteries are the scriptures. The mysteries are us meditating on the life of Christ, of the Holy Family, Our Lady, Saint Joseph, the time of Jesus as he walked the earth, the giving of his life through his passion and death, the crucifixion, the resurrection. The rosary 
becomes a great school of meditation, a school of thought. It becomes conversation with God. It becomes conversation with Our Lady. Countless popes have referenced the importance of embracing the rosary as a spiritual weapon. But the power of God working through the rosary and the intercession of our Blessed Mother has played its part even in battle, even in warfare. In the history of Christianity, we have seen this over and over. One of the most prominent times is in 1571, the Battle of Lepanto. This famous naval battle took place between the Muslims and the Christians. At the request of Pope St. Pius V, the Holy League was formed. Pius V also asked all the people of Europe to pray the rosary more devoutly. As the men who fought in the Battle of Lepanto prepared, they were all given rosaries and all encouraged to pray the rosary daily. And the day that they sail into battle, the winds shifted in favor of the Christian army. Pope St. Pius V received an interior message that the battle had been won. He rose, went to the window, and shouted it to the people. Shortly after this, October 7th becomes the day dedicated as the Feast of Our Lady of Victory. But what God has been asking us over these centuries, from St. Dominic to our present time, is that we make every month, every week, every day, a day that is dedicated to praying the rosary. We call on the intercession of our Blessed Mother, who, as Scripture has made very clear, is the one that crushes the head of the serpent. To have her by our side at all times is critical. And as the wedding feast of Cana makes clear to us, the second luminous mystery, Our Lady's final words in Scripture, do whatever he tells you. Do what my son tells you. The Blessed Mother has a perfect desire to see you and me in heaven. By God's power, she's given us the rosary. And by God's power, that rosary becomes a sword in her hands to cut through evil. There are times when praying the rosary isn't always going to feel exciting. It's not always going to feel entertaining. But there are times in life when we have to do the right thing, whether it feels exciting or not. For example, a student shouldn't skip school just because he or she doesn't feel like going. The consequence is failing the class. An employee shouldn't skip work just because he or she doesn't feel like going. The consequence is losing the job. The rosary is the same way. When we look at the magnitude of the spiritual battle and we see the very real consequences of losing that battle, the rosary is no longer just a nice idea. It becomes one of the most powerful things you could possibly pick up. The more we get our priorities straight, the more the rosary makes sense and the more instinctive it is for us to turn to its power. Our Lady has given us 15 promises to those who are consistently devoted to the rosary. We have her word on these 15 things. To all those who shall recite my rosary devoutly, I promise my special protection and very great graces. To those who shall persevere in the recitation of my rosary shall receive some signal grace. The rosary shall be a very powerful armor against hell. It will destroy vice, deliver from sin, and dispel heresy. The rosary will make virtue and good works flourish and will obtain for souls the most abundant divine mercies. It will substitute in hearts love of God for love of the world and will lift them to the desire of heavenly and eternal things. How many souls shall sanctify themselves by this means? Those who trust themselves to me through the rosary shall not perish. Those who shall recite my rosary devoutly, meditating on its mysteries, shall not be overwhelmed by misfortune. The sinner shall be converted. The just shall grow in grace and become worthy of eternal life. Those truly devoted to my rosary shall not die without the sacraments of the church. Those who recite my rosary shall find during their life and at their death the light of God, the fullness of his graces, and shall share in the merits of the blessed. I shall deliver very promptly from purgatory the souls devoted to my rosary. The true children of my rosary shall enjoy great glory in heaven. What you ask through my rosary, you shall obtain. Those who propagate my rosary shall be aided by me in all their necessities. I have obtained from my son that all the members of the rosary confraternity shall have for their brethren the saints of heaven during their life and at the hour of death. To those who recite my rosary faithfully are all my beloved children, the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Devotion to my rosary is a great sign of predestination. It boils down to one main thing. Will you and I take this seriously? And will we respond? 
Will we take up the spiritual weapons that God gives us, especially those that he gives us through the Blessed Mother, the rosary, the scapular, our sword and our shield, and will we put them into practice every day of our lives with greater devotion and greater fervor? Will we recognize what is really at stake? Your soul, my soul, and the souls of so many others, especially those that he's entrusted to our care. God would not be sending Our Lady to the world over and over, especially with weapons that he gives us through her, if it was not serious. I want to thank you for joining forces with us here. And I want to encourage you, remind you, please check out EWTN's and Doug Berry's YouTube channels and follow us both on Facebook. Remember, when we listen to God, when we listen to the, the urgent call of Our Lady for conversion and take up the spiritual weapons that we're given, the rosary, the scapular in particular, then we are...